The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. So basically, you saw all these things that you can build in the first talk with Anke. You saw all how to make these movable uh, soft robotic things. And I'm going to introduce to you actually the way how these are fabricated and the ideology, 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 whatever, behind how you, uh, how you do this. So first of all, uh, who am I? I'm Marcel Lahai. I'm a research assistant and a PhD candidate here at the chair. Uh, at the RWTH Aachen University, and I'm at the Media Computing Group of Professor Borges. And my main research interest is this personal fabrication. So, the, the general first question that you might have now is, what is personal fabrication? And to make it simple first, personal fabrication basically is the idea that everybody who has an idea about an object, that everybody who wants to create an object actually can do so. And every, actually can turn their ideas into a physical object. So personal fabrication is basically the arrow in between those things. So the way of how you are able to turn your ideas into physical objects. And the thing behind this is that we want to enable everyone to do so. So not just people who are, who are knowledgeable in these things, not just people who already have these skills, but we actually want to empower everyone to create critical objects with ease. So the question now is how can we do this? And for this we actually are using something, an old method, which is called digital fabrication. And digital fabrication is basically the idea of turning bits into atoms, and that means to create material objects from a digital design. So um, I, did a, I did a small example of this yesterday. I went into a uh, 3D design tool, which is called Autodesk Fusion, like the one that uh, Anke already mentioned, and I quickly created this CTHCI logo that I showed to you. And what I'm ending up with, as I previously said, the 3D model of this now. And now I have a digital 3D model of the CTHCI logo. And if you remember uh, what Mota said about this, that digital fabrication tools are about creating material objects from digital designs, and I need to think about how am I actually doing this. And for this, digital fabrication actually uses two methodologies. First one is called subtractive manufacturing, the second is called additive manufacturing. Subtractive manufacturing is, uh, is actually what's kind of in the, main, in the name. You take a material and you take a machine and you gradually remove material from the, from the source material until you have the shape that you actually want to end up with. So as you can see here with this milling machine, it actually takes away material until I think in the end it should be a ring or something. And for this we can utilize two machines. The first one is a CNC mill, which is kind of a drill, drilling head that drills away material, and the second one that's usually used is a laser cutter, which is a high-powered laser that burns into the material and therefore creates shapes out of it. The th second thing is additive manufacturing. And additive manufacturing is basically that we take a material, make it somehow liquid, which is liquid, which is usually done with plastic, and build layer upon layer of these materials until we end up with the cha shape that we, we actually want. So, this is what I did yesterday with the CTHCI logo. I put it into our 3D printer, and the 3D printer then turns this digital design into a physical object in the end. And this is usually done by 3D printers. The thing now is, all these machines actually some years ago were really costly, and actually only, be, only people who would have access to these, which were usually factories and big companies, were able to use digital fabrication. However, this changed in the recent years, and mostly it's changed due to this guy, which is Professor Neil Gershenfeld, and he's a professor at the MIT, and he introduced this concept of actually opening up these shops and opening up machines to, uh, to other people. And he's going to explain this in a tech talk, which I'm going to show you, which is around six minutes, and there he's showing the concept of this idea of how we can uh, make other people have access to these machines. I bought all these machines. We made a modest proposal to the NSF. We wanted to be able to make anything on any length scale. 
um, all in one place. Because you can't segregate digital fabrication by a discipline or a length scale. So we put together focused nano beam writers and supersonic water jet cutters and um, excimer micromachining systems. But I had a problem. Once I had all these machines, I was spending too much time teaching students to use them. So I started teaching a class modestly called How to Make Almost Anything. And that wasn't meant to be provocative. It was just for a few research students. But the first day of class looked like this. You know, hundreds of people came in begging. All my life I've been waiting for this class. I'll do anything to do it. Then they'd ask, can you teach it at MIT? It seems too useful. And then, then the next... <laughs> surprising thing was they weren't there to do research, they were there because they wanted to make stuff. Um, they, they had no conventional um, technical background. At the end of a semester, they integrated their skills. I'll show an old video. Kelly was a sculptor, and this is what she did with her semester project. Hi, I'm Kelly, and this is my screen body. Do you ever find yourself in a situation where you really have to scream, but you can't because you're at work? or you're in a classroom, or you're watching your children, or you're in any number of situations where it's just not permitted. Well, ScreenBody is a portable space for screaming. When a user screams into ScreenBody, their scream is silenced. But it is also recorded for later release, where, when, and how the user chooses. So Einstein would like this. This student made a web browser for parrots, lets parrots surf the net and talk to other parrots. Um, this student's made an alarm clock you wrestle to prove you're awake. This is one that defend, a dress that defends your personal space. This isn't technology for communication, it's technology to prevent it. Um, this is a device that lets you see your music. Um, this is a student who made a machine that makes machines. And he, and he made it by making Lego bricks that do the computing. Just year after year, and I finally realized the students were showing the killer app of personal fabrication is products for a market of one person. You don't need this for what you can get in Walmart, you need this for what makes you unique. Ken Olson famously said, nobody needs a computer in the home, but you don't use it for inventory and payroll. Deck is now twice bankrupt. You don't need personal fabrication in the home to buy what you can buy because you can buy it. You need it for what makes you unique, just like personalization. So with that, in turn, um, $20 million today does this. 20 years from now, we'll make Star Trek replicators that make anything. Um, the students hijacked all the machines I bought to do personal fabrication today. When you spend that much of your money, there's a government requirement to do outreach, which often means classes at a local school, a website, stuff that's just not that exciting. So I made a deal with my NSF program managers that I, instead of talking about it, I'd give people the tools. This wasn't meant to be provocative or important, but we put together these fab labs. It's about $20,000 in equipment that approximate both what the $20 million does and where it's going. A laser cutter to do press fit assembly of 3D from 2D, a sign cutter to plot in copper to do electromagnetics, a micron scale numerically controlled billing machine for precise structures, programming tools for less than a dollar, 100 nanosecond microcontrollers. It lets you work from microns and microseconds on up. And they exploded around the world. This wasn't scheduled, but they went from inner city Boston to Pabal in India to Sakandi Takaradi on Ghana's coast to Soshanguvi in a township in South Africa to the far north of Norway, uncovering or helping uncover for all the attention to the digital divide, we would find unused computers in all these places. If a farmer in a rural village, a kid needs to measure and modify the world, not just get information about it on a screen, that there's really a fabrication and an instrumentation divide bigger than the digital divide. And the way you close it is not IT for the masses, but IT development for the masses. So in place after place, we saw this same progression, that we'd open one of these fab labs, or we didn't, this is too, crazy to think of. We didn't think this up, that we would get pulled to these places. We'd open it. The first step was just empowerment. You can see it in her face. Just this joy of I can do it. This is a girl in inner city Boston who had just done a high tech on demand craft sale in this inner city community center. It goes on from there to um, serious hands on technical education informally out of schools. In Ghana, we had set up one of these labs. Uh, we had designed a network sensor and kids would show up and refuse to leave the lab. There was a girl who insisted we stay late at night. 
her first night in the lab because Yay! she was going to make the sensor. So she insisted Fun on fabbing the board, learning how to stuff it, learning how to program it. She didn't really know what she was doing or why she was doing it, but she knew she just had to do it. There's something electric about it. And this was late, you know, 11 o'clock at night. And I think I was the only person surprised when what she built worked the first time. And I've shown this to engineers at big companies and they say they can't do this. Any one thing she's doing, they can do better, but it's distributed over many people and many sites, and they can't do in an afternoon what this little girl in rural Ghana is doing. I am eight years old. I made a stacking board. And again, that was just, just for the joy of it. Um, then these labs started doing serious problem solving, instrumentation for agriculture in India, steam turbines for energy conversion in Ghana, high gain antennas and thin client computers. And then in turn, businesses started to grow, like making these antennas. And finally, the lab started doing invention. We're learning more from them than we're giving them. I, I, I was showing my kids in a fab lab how to use it. They invented a way to do a construction kit out of a cardboard box, which as you see up there, that's becoming a business. But their design was better than Saul's design at MIT. So there's now three students at MIT doing their theses on scaling the work of eight-year-old children because they had better designs. Real invention is happening in these labs. OK. So this is a talk from 2006, and I think he invented the idea of Fab Labs around 2001. So a Fab Lab basically is this open space which now gives everyone the access to machines like laser cutters, 3D printers, and CNC mills. This, for example, is the Fab Lab here. So what changes here now is that previously, um, to build something, you would probably be someone like a product designer in a company. Then you needed to pitch your design to your superiors. They make sure that it's financially good and stable. And then you need to give this to somebody else who's going then to fabricate it in a big, fab in a big factory in mass production or something like this. So the problem here is that only products that actually are financially good or make sense are then produced. And we leave out the single person or the individual need. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> and also, suddenly, now in these fab labs, we have generations of people in there. You saw kids in there. There are fab labs for elderly people. There are fab labs for basically anyone, school children, and whatever category you, you might think of. And this opens up huge possibility for research also later. And actually, when you build a fab lab like the one that we, we have, you're committing to one, something that's called the fab charter. Actually, the, you don't need to, to read all this. Actually, the important part in this is who can use a fab lab. So fab labs are available as a community resource, offering open access for individual, individuals as well as ske scheduled access for programs. And now the question that leads out of this is, we have this huge new opportunity. How can we connect this to HCI research? As I said previously, you suddenly have a multitude of new people who are interested in using these machines. And actually, getting one of these machines is really easy today. They are 3D printers, which only cost about $200 nowadays. So you can actually buy one, one for your home. You don't even need to go into a fab lab or makerspace or something similar. But the problem is, these machines were originally designed for professionals. So for people who get to learn these machines, who are getting to put a lot of time and effort into these machines. But the goal, as I said in the beginning, is that everybody should be able to use them with ease. So to give you an example, this is the interface for the laser cutter that we have in our fab lab, which is an Epilog Zing laser cutter. And this is, the, this is the thing that you are supposed to use when you want to use the machine. Just now imagine yourself getting into the fab lab and let's say you already put your design in there. And let's say you have plexiglass of about three millimeter. Can you make out what you now need to do in here? What are the settings that you need to set? What are the things that you need to use to cut these three millimeter plexiglass? Just make an educated guess. Not you. <laughs> yes? Well, there's a little box called piece size. So maybe it's vertical. Yeah. You mean this one here? Yeah. yeah. 
So this might be the dimensions of your thing. Uh, so apparently it does not get the dimensions of your, your, uh, your design. You might need to put them in there. Nobody knows. But let's say, let's say it automatically got your design, your design dimension, and they are in there, and that's the dimensions of your design. But now the laser has some certain parameters which you need to set. Also maybe think about what might be the difference about raster design, vector design, Yes? I think the vector design is uh, the input vector is the uh, vector Yes, correct. Um, so I guess you have to use it if you use a vector as input, mm -hmm. and the rest of the thing is if you use uh, like the normal image type, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so basically what you said is that raster design will be used when we use a raster image, and vector design will be, will be used when we use a vector image. But this already then uh, has the requirement that you know the difference, right? That you know what a vector image actually is and what a, what a raster image is, and not everybody knows of this. I mean, sometimes even a lot of computer scientists don't know the difference between these, so you cannot expect everybody to know the difference. But, okay, so, so we found out what the raster setting is and what the vector setting is, but we still haven't figured out what we need to set for the material that we used. Any ideas there? The power and the speed? Yes. So, actually, we first need to choose whether we have a raster setting and then whether we have a vector setting, and then we need to choose the power and speed. And these are given in percentage, so we first of all need to know the power of the laser and to then set this to the parameters for our plexiglass. And I'm pretty sure none of you knows which parameters to set there. And to be certainly honest, I even wouldn't know out of my head what I need to put there. And actually one of our students some years ago in 2011 had the same problem. And he came up with an idea for his bachelor thesis, it was Thomas Oster, to build a tool called Visicat. And this is actually a tool that we are using quite frequently now and that is quite common to be used in fab labs now when you work with laser cutters. And it now looks like this when you open it. Um, on the left side you actually have your laser bed, so there you have actually a preview of how it will look like what you put in there. So let's assume just I put something in there. Which should work. Oh, yeah. So again, our CTHCI logo. So again, the same as it was before. I started the software, put in my design, and my design actually appears there, and I can already see a preview of my design. Um, so now let's zoom into this here. Uh, again, you have plexiglass of three millimeters with you. You want to cut it out of there. What are you going to do now? What are the things that you need to click here? Is it too easy? <laughs> Hopefully, yes. <laughs> you need to select material from the yes. Yes, right. So you no longer have complex things like, like laser settings, power, or frequency, or stuff like this. You can actually directly, uh, directly select the material that you have and the material thickness. I think I also have this in the video here. So you're going in there just scrolling through the list of available materials. I mean, you still need to know what the name of your material is, then you go for plexiglass, then you need to know the material thickness, and that's almost this. The only thing is then that you need to say that you want to cut everything, and if you actually want to, you can still look at the laser settings. But the cool thing about this is that you no longer need to know much about how a laser actually works. You only need to know the material that you have, put in the machine, set the correct material, and you're basically done. And that makes it already way easier for everybody to work with, with a laser cutter. Um, I'm using power here. So, we have currently as with 3D printers. So we now make sure that things are going to be easy to use. The next thing is, if you think about 3D printers, um, you might think about this thing here. So, this is a punch card, and this is what was used to program computers back in the days. And actually, um, I like the thing that Patrick Baudet said about 3D printers and punch cards, that if you go back to the beginnings of interactive computing, early computer users were probably reasonably happy placing their punch cards into the reader and waiting for their output to arrive hours later, which is pretty much where 3D printing stands today. And he's actually right about it. 
The issue with 3D printing is that, as I showed you beforehand, I create my digital design. And with my digital design, I have all the interactivity of a digital design that I need. I can go back and forth. I have a design history. I can change thing, things on the actual design. And this makes it really e easy for me to explore the design. But once I'm done with my model and I put it into the 3D printer, I just press basically print. And the printer usually then takes hours to print the design. And I'm losing full control over what happens then. I can only basically switch the printer off. So I have no way of, way of when I see in between the design, when in, the, in between the printing that something might be wrong or weird to change it. I can just stop it and do it again. So this is something that actually a paper which is called Reform, Integrating Physical and Digital Design through Bidirectional Fabrication introduced. And it was done by Christian Weichel and his colleagues at Lancaster University and presented and used in 2015. And what they did is basically create a new machine that enables you to go back and forth in your design cycles with this machine together. Reform is a new way to think about digital fabrication. Reform blends physical shaping with digital design through a new bidirectional fabrication process. With Reform, the artifact being designed can itself be the interface to make the machine a part of having the idea and realizing it. This makes designing physical objects more direct, reducing the distance between the physical and virtual worlds. We can take advantage of things that hands are good at and use the machine to perform operations that machines are good at. Taking this approach opens up novel design interactions this allows the design environment to stay in the physical world, whilst all the while your changes and modifications are kept track of in the digital model. This allows for low cost iteration, quick adjustments and the ability to undo and redo the actions as you design. We use head tracking to overlay the digital scan on top of your physical model. This can also be used to preview and select digital operations live. You can export your model at any point and share it online or produce it via a conventional 3D printer. Reform combines additive and subtractive manufacture and uses scanning to produce a 3D model of what you're working on. Continuous 3D scanning at each stage of the process allows us to entangle the physical form being designed with its digital counterpart. The combination of additive and subtractive methods increases the set of operations the machine can achieve and the flexibility of designing with the machine. Reform's hybrid approach to fabrication through the use of an additive clay extrusion system and a subtractive milling tool means we're able to explore novel applications of the system as follows. We can use the augmented reality preview to experiment before we execute, for instance, when flattening a surface. We can select precise marks and from these extrude up or drill down to a given depth. We can manually draw on the prototype and then the machine will recognize marks so we can reconfigure changes. If we make physical changes, the machine will recognize these and the combination of milling and extrusion systems will allow us to undo, reconfigure or redo these changes. The use of a scanning system to entangle physical with digital means the designer can work by hand or use a series of versatile digital operations. As we move beyond these simple yet suggestive possibilities, systems like Reform will allow us to bring the digital and physical design processes closer together through entangled bidirectional fabrication. So what they basically did <clears throat> is they built this machine which then now uh, combines the two techniques which I showed you before which are called additive and subtractive manufacturing. 
And they also utilized um, the fact that, for example, with clay, you can still mold it afterwards and you can basically add it to the design and subtract it with these. And you can still also mold it with your hands. So the machine actually has two, two um, yeah, machining tools in the middle here, um, a printing hat and a milling tool. And then there are a bunch of things like a control thing that you can use to control uh, your design in there, uh, a camera, and also they had this uh, display in the front where actually they project the digital design onto such that you can see while you're in front of the machine how the machine recognizes your, uh, your design and how the design is actually now built. And they introduced this new concept or this concept that they call bidirectional fabrication, which is now the third, the third term of fabrication that you're going to hear today. And they are basically claiming that this bidirectional fabrication introduces three fundamental ways of dealing with objects or of dealing with creating objects. The first one is that the design is not limited to a digital model, but it's also, also a thing that you can shape physically. Um, one thing that I explained to you before is that people with digital design need to learn all these tools, need to learn how to use 3D modeling systems and things like this. Actually, if you think about it, let's say during winter and you're creating a snowball, you're pretty good with your hands to create a sphere. But if I put you in front of a 3D modeling system, I think you need some minutes to figure out how to do an actual sphere in there. So it turns out, thanks all of our world and all around us is mostly, yet mostly physical, we're pretty good with dealing with physical things. And we're actually pretty good with shaping things with our hands. So they claim that first of all, an A here, oops, sorry, uh, you can form things with your hands quite easily. And in B, you can actually utilize tools that you're already used to, like knives, to form the object again. And in C, the next cool thing is, for example, if you want to form something around something, let's say they wanted to build a cup holder here, you can just take the cup and push it into the object. Creating something like this, getting the measurements right, <clears throat> or getting close to something that actually holds your cup tightly in the end, it's really hard to do in digital fabrication because you really need to do these measurements, you then need to go into a 3D modeling system, and you then need to recreate your op the object digitally. The next thing is that they introduced this machine which now has additive and subtractive design, uh, so uh, manufacturing, so it can scan what you're, uh, what you're doing, so basically turn something into a digital object again, and then print it while you worked on the digital design to turn it back into a physical object. And this actually brings it back to the third concept, which introduced this now iterative design process. So that you're no longer limited to the rigid object that a 3D printer, for example, creates, but you can actually work around with it. You can reshape it. You can utilize these digital things, which are, let's say, undo and redo, and you can also already make them physical. The next thing is, let's say you shaped something with your hands. You're pretty good with your hands to shape it into a rough thing, but you're pretty bad at making for example, things like straight lines, uh, corners, and stuff like this, because actually our hands are not good at doing intricate small things. And then you can put this thing that you created in your hand, with your hands, the rough thing in the machine, scan it, make it to a digital model, use digital tools to make like edges straight or something like this, and then print it back again to actually let you feel how this thing, how this thing feels. For example, like they did with the game controller that they had in their, in their uh, video. So you can feel again whether it fits your needs. And then if not, you can just put it back in and work, and work back and forth with it. And this creates a really fast iteration process. Um, speaking of making things easy, um, this is a software that's called Cube. And it's a software that enables you to create laser cuts, uh, press fit construction things. Let's first look at the video. We have created a software system called Cube, which we use to produce everything you see in the shot. We propose a new interaction paradigm in which users create 3D objects by stacking simple primitive elements on top of each other, such as this little cube I'm holding here. This is a robot figuring created by one of the participants of our user study in a 60-minute session. Once the object has been fabricated, I can start assembling it by injecting voxels into voxel-shaped holes. So, what they presented here is something that was utilized beforehand, which is actually 
going from flat objects uh, by assembling them into 3D objects. And the cool thing about this is that previously it was really hard to do these because you kind of needed to go digitally, design them flat, think about in your head how it will turn out in the end, then laser cut them, try to assemble them, and then usually you figure out that something does not fit because your flat design previously does not assemble correctly into the 3D design. This is, for example, from Anke, what she did in a course previously. So the idea is that you first go into a laser cutter, laser cut these things, and then assemble them together, together to have this shape in the end, the 3D model. And the cool thing about this is that usually when you work in a fab lab, people come there because they think of these cool machines called 3D printers, which can turn your things, your digital design, into actual 3D objects. And it's quite easily because you can just put your digital design in there, press a button, and then a 3D model pops out. Turns out the issue with these machines is that fabrication takes hours. A 3D printer, usually for a small object, needs about three to four hours, and the moment you go for bigger objects, it can cost days or can take days. What people then usually do if they need rapid prototyping, they go back to this to this uh, type or this type or technique of fabrication. So actually creating something flat with a laser cutter, which just takes minutes, like even less than 10 minutes, and then assembling in it, and then seeing how the rough shade of how it turns out. And afterwards, if that actually works, you can then go to a 3D printer. And basically, you only use the 3D printer for your final design. And this makes rapid prototyping actually quite easy. The next thing when you, go, when you come into these open spaces, when you work with these machines, is that usually you're missing instructions. Um, you might have seen something online, how to assemble things, but this usually turns you into having a computer next to you and then having your tools on the other side, and then this is usually not uh, optimal. So uh, Knibber and Al and his colleagues basically came up with the Smart Maker Space, which is an immersive instruction space for physical tasks, and they created this artifact which now guides users through the, assembly, uh, through the assembly process of an object. We present the Smart Makerspace, an immersive instructional workspace for physical tasks. Traditionally, makers find their instructions online through websites such as Instructables, Make and IKEA Hackers. While these sites include resources across a range of topics, the emphasis is on walkthroughs that are similar in nature to traditional paper manuals. However, research on tutorial systems for complex software, such as Chronicle, Mixed-T and Stencil-based tutorials, has demonstrated the benefits of a more integrated, immersive experience. What's more, physical and software tasks share similar difficulties, such as how do I use this tool? Do I need these as well? When do I get to use this? Not to mention, where is my tool? On top of this, actions and physical tasks are often irreversible, and tools can be dangerous when used incorrectly. To derive requirements for our smart maker space, we developed a maker task and ran a Think Cloud study. Our study highlighted four primary issues and differences between novices and experts that our system can aim to address. These include the need for an overview to support a personalized approach, wider domain knowledge to build confidence and provide feedback, easier tool selection, and clearer tool usage support to ensure safe practice. We then built a smart maker space, focusing on delivering a rich instructional experience for a single maker. The space is based around an 84-inch smart workbench, toolbox, and power tools. The workbench includes a work and tool area, a manual with buttons for navigation, an overview to encourage a wider understanding of the task, a custom parts area that labels and highlights relevant pieces, and a tool space complete with smart power tools that highlights a required tool and feeds back on their current state and usage. The workspace also provides videos of previous makers conducting the relevant step and tool clips to encourage safe tool usage. Finally, the table provides safety alerts and usage prompts, including aware audio that compensates for any tools being used. The system can remind makers to wear smart safety glasses and prompt them when using a tool incorrectly. Next to the table there is a smart toolbox with step relevant LEDs that guide users towards the correct buckets. We run a study on our smart maker space using our maker task. 
In this study, our novice participants use tools and techniques more akin to experience makers. The participants also rated 13 out of 15 of our table's features as useful. Our work highlights the opportunities for engaging systems that support physical tasks through an Internet of Things approach. We presented the Smart Makerspace, an immersive instructional workspace for physical tasks. Okay, so what they basically did, as I said, is they built a system which presents documentation to you and presents how you assemble things. And they basically are going to, uh, no, they're basically showing two things with this. The first one that I said previously is that for research, personal fabrication opens this new community of people who don't know a lot about these machines and actually need a lot of help to utilize them and therefore giving us, giving us as research, uh, researchers a huge opportunity to create new interfaces for them. But secondly, personal fabrication also enabled something else. And again, for research to create prototypes. What you can see here with this design is actually they use some pretty simple things, just some sensors, like a Hall effect sensor is just a sensor that um, measures the magnetic field. So you can basically take a, take a magnet and once it comes close to this, you can create a switch with this. And they just use proximity sensor and a temperature sensor. And for this, or with these simple sensors, they created a system that on the outside looks quite complex. So a system that can actually see which tool you are using, how the tool is currently operated, so which temperature, which temperature it has, and whether you're using them in the correct order. Also, their so-called smart goggles are just safety goggles that have a bunch of, bunch of sensors attached to the side. And with, with this, you can see that utilizing things as 3D printing, um, CNC milling, and all these other different things, also creating electronics, which is also possible in these maker spaces. You can now, as a researcher, have an idea, and without actually knowing a lot about the technicalities behind it, build cool new prototypes. Like, for example, I think some of you are going to do for the end research project. So, this always brings me back to a thing that we had some years ago. To explore in interactions with sensor-enhanced mobile phones. Let's go back here and let me explain more to you. Um, which was called iStuff Mobile. And this actually was a toolkit that we built that built up on this idea to rather easily create prototypes. And these were basically just a bunch of sensors connected to a software toolkit that you could use on old phones, or nowadays old your phones, and therefore enable new ways of building interfaces with the sensing technology. So now let's go to the video. It's to explore interactions with sensor-enhanced mobile phones. In this video, we will showcase four different prototyping examples to illustrate how iStuff Mobile can be used. Let's say, for example, that a designer wants to create a new UI that lets users scroll through a list on a mobile phone by squeezing and tilting it. To create a low-fidelity prototype of this new interface, the designer simply tapes the required sensor to the back of a standard mobile phone. Our patch panel plugins manage communication between Quartz Composer and the event heap. The event heap infrastructure greatly simplifies distributed application coordination. Here, the designer is using Quartz Composer to view the accelerometer output. The prototype foreground applications, such as this static image, used to prototype a controller for a multi-screen presentation. The phone key presses are mapped inside of Quartz Composer to control presentations on remote screens. In another example, the user can navigate through a user interface using the sweep technique to detect motion in the phone's camera view. Quartz Composer's strength of generating compelling interactive visualizations can be seen with this weather browser for public displays. The forecast is updated live through RSS feeds from Yahoo Weather. So. What I like about this is the simplicity about it. It's basically just a bunch of sensors taped to a phone, but it still now enables the researcher to prototype fastly. And this is the same thing with the Fab Lab that we have here, which is actually not originally a Fab Lab. Previously, it was just our workshop, which we now open to the public. And this, having this workshop, having all these machines, which are now usable, enables us to build cool new prototypes.
Like for example, Morris Messerschmidt, who was a thesis student here, have this idea of that CNC mills are really hard to approach. They are these huge machines and often we are doing workshops with kids and for them they are a little bit scary, really complicated and also sometimes dangerous. So he had this idea to build a small machine that just does one thing quite well and it actually creates the small badges that where uh, uh, children can put their names on and basically you have this uh, the screen on the top here where now with touch interaction you can just design your smart badge on there also so your badge and then afterwards you have this milling machine in here which has a lot of windows and open space so that you can see actually what's going on inside and it's a really small machine that you can easily carry around bring to workshops and that has a lot of safety functions in there that it can actually be operated by children without harming them or without actually scaring them or doing other different things. So it enables again, or having these new techniques or having these new tools available enabled one of our students to build such a cool project, which I really like. <coughs> so this is basically the end of this talk. And I showed you an introduction to personal fabrication. I showed you this new research opportunity that we now have new people or new, new students and generations of people who are now interested in utilizing these machines, that you can use these machines quite simply and that you actually can build cool new prototypes with it as a researcher. And thank you for your, uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.